All right, well, good evening, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. And I am going to go into my slides for the moment. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eleanor Rangers. I'm the president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. And welcome to our September History in Our Backyard webinar. Um, we've been doing these since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, our first uh, webinar was in June of 2020. And they've been quite successful thanks to our loyal attendee attendees. So we will be plan we will be uh, continuing these into, into 2022 and uh, hopefully beyond. I did want to make uh, just an announcement um, again, uh, as I did last month, that you know we have done um, programming uh, live in the past in Warminster. Um, but with the pandemic, we've had to put those on hiatus for the time being. Um, but uh, hopefully, depending on the pandemic, uh, hopefully receding, we would like to be able to restart some limited live programming. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for 2022. We'll provide you guys with more information uh, as we get closer to 2022, but I will definitely be continuing webinars. So those will still be available. So if anything, the live programming would be supplementing what we'll be doing uh, on a monthly basis with the, with the webinars. Um, and as always, you know, we are a 501c3 organization and uh, we certainly benefit from the generosity of uh, those who choose to give us a donation to our organization so that we can help to um, sponsor lecturers from out of town um, and some other things that are on our bucket list like transcription of interviews and um, when you know we're back to doing live events being able to support displays at different events and also um, some marginal costs to go into website maintenance as many of you are aware we did do a major upgrade to our website over the last year and um, you know there are some uh, marginal maintenance fees that go along with that. So uh, certainly, you know, some things to consider uh, if you choose to make a, a donation. Um, one thing I will mention that you see on the lower part of the screen that one easy way to do this is through smile.amazon.com. You can actually designate our organization as um, one that you would like to make a contribution to through Amazon and your purchases, a small proportion of those purchases you make on Amazon uh, are there's a match process that goes on with Amazon. And on a quarterly basis, those um, that money is actually given to our organization. So another seamless way to uh, donate if, if you so choose. Um, we've had a great year of lectures so far, and we're gonna be wrapping up the year uh, with some equally exciting topics. Um, this evening, of course, Project Manhigh. But then uh, October, we have Michelle Evans returning to talk about uh, the X-15 program again, and specifically about Mike Adams, the only casualty from the X-15 program. Um, so very much looking forward to her presentation in October. Um, I am not sure yet if we are going to be doing a live event uh, for November with Veterans Day. Uh, so please stay tuned uh, with that. If we are not doing something live, I will have some type of commemorative event um, online as we did last year. Um, but also later in November, we have David Stumpf returning to actually talk about the Minuteman missile program. So uh, another very exciting topic that I'm excited to bring to you guys this year. And then finally, we're gonna wrap, wrap up 2021 with a panel discussion. First time we've actually done, I think a full panel of individuals who were involved with research uh, and riding and training and operating the dynamic flight simulator, also known as the old Johnsville centrifuge. Um, so pretty exciting uh, way to end up uh, our 2021. So hopefully you'll all be able to listen in to all of these events. And we do, if you're not able to make it to our events, we do record them. Um, and uh, we do upload those to our YouTube channel. Um, so you can definitely find them there. We also try to keep that site updated with some other interesting videos and so forth that we find uh, on YouTube uh, related to Cold War related events or possibly the Navy and so forth. So, you know, check it out. There's always some good stuff on there. 
to keep you occupied if uh, you have nothing else going on in your life. Um, <clears throat> and um, I did want to just mention that we did a couple of recent updates uh, to our web page. Um, actually, we've periodically had um, people ask us about the Willow Grove Naval Air Station as well as the Naval Air Propulsion Center in Trenton, New Jersey. So those who are from the Southeastern Pennsylvania area may be familiar with those uh, additional locations, no longer operational, uh, but also played significant roles in the Cold War. So we've started pages for both of those um, sites. So um, you know, we anticipate periodically we may have some updates to those sites. Or if you have anything to contribute to those sites, take a look. Um, we're always looking for photographs, for example, um, to add to our digital archive. So um, just wanted to uh, briefly mention that as well. We also have a Facebook page. So if you uh, are on uh, that social media platform, check us out. Um, we do try to keep that site updated with announcements about our upcoming programs, but we also occasionally will post some other articles of interest on there, uh, for example. Um, one type of thing we do try to also announce uh, on the Facebook site, um, as well as our, um, our email distribution list, um, is that uh, what I would call our sister organization, the Cold War Museum in Vin Hill, Virginia, um, actually has webinars <clears throat> usually once or twice a month. Um, and I've been trying to just get the word out about those events. Um, I've attended um, the last, I don't know, three or four, and they're always really good. Um, and uh, I would definitely encourage you to check them out. They do charge a fee, so they do charge $20 through Eventbrite, but they're definitely worth it. It's a nice way to spend, um, you know, a, an hour or two on a Sunday afternoon if you have nothing else going on. And um, I mean, you're getting firsthand accounts from uh, individuals that were involved in a, in a large number of Cold War related activities, a lot of uh, reconnaissance type of work. So I would definitely encourage you to check those out. And I think they're a great way to supplement the programming uh, that we bring to you um, every month. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker this evening, um, Greg Kennedy. Give me just a moment. I'm going to admit there are a bunch of people waiting in the queue here. I want to make sure they all are able to get in. Okay. So we're very excited to have Greg Kennedy speaking tonight on a, a program that probably not a lot of people know about, Project Lanhai. Um, and I'll let him get into that momentarily, but I do want to do a proper introduction. So Greg is the former director of education at the NASTAR Center, a leading provider of spaceflight training for commercial vehicles in Southampton, PA. Um, that uh, center, for example, was involved with or has been involved with training, uh, centrifuge training for the uh, folks uh, endeavoring to fly on Virgin Galactic. So just an example of uh, who they are. Um, previously, Greg was associated, associate curator of manned space flight at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. He was also director of the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas. Um, and a founding director of the American Airlines C.R. Smith Museum in Fort Worth. Um, he was also the executive director of the Space Center in Alamogordo, New, Mexi New Mexico, executive director of the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum in Liberal, Kansas, and executive director of the American Helicopter Museum in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, also of note, uh, Greg is an aerospace historian and uh, has several books to his name. But I do want to just mention the one of most immediate relevance this evening, uh, entitled Touching Space, the Story of Project Manhai. So without further ado, I am going to do the switcheroo and allow Greg to share his uh, slides. And uh, we'll go ahead and get go going with that. So just give me a moment, Greg. And I am going to pa I'm going to get out of sharing and let you transition over. Great. Well, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, to be here tonight. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh, attending this webinar. Uh, the topic, uh, my subject tonight is Project Manhai, uh, which was uh, really the first foray into space for the uh, United States. Um, there we go. Okay, uh, we live surrounded by a vast ocean of air, uh, we call the atmosphere. 
Now the atmosphere can be divided into several layers depending upon its physical characteristics. For example, we live in the troposphere. That's the bottommost layer of the atmosphere. Uh, it's where most of the air is. It goes up to about nine miles. Then above that is the stratosphere, which is characterized as uh, being uh, complete, very dry. Uh, there's no moisture there. It's also uh, intensely cold. Now the ozone layer, which protects us from solar radiation from the sun, uh, from ultraviolet radiation, uh, that's in the upper level of the stratosphere. Above that, the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Uh, so um, again, we've got this ocean of air and we really started to explore that in the 18th century uh, with the invention of the hot air balloon. Uh, the Montgolfier brothers, of course, flew the first hot air balloons, uh, 1783. Their first, uh, the first flight to carry humans reached about 5,000 feet. Uh, so well within the uh, thermosphere, no, no problems with that. Uh, but then soon balloonists started going higher and higher. And as they did, they encountered hypoxia, uh, the effects of a lack of oxygen, because they soon discovered that the higher you go, the less air there is to breathe. Now in 1862, uh, scientists uh, Co Coxwell and Glacier went up to 26,000 feet in an open basket. Uh, Glacier passed out from hypoxia. Coxwell was uh, incapacitated to the point where he couldn't grip the rope that would open the vent valve to allow them to descend. So he had to climb up in the rigging and open the vent valve rope with his teeth. Uh, but then he soon passed out, but they both regained consciousness, regained control of the balloon at when it was lower and landed without incident. Now, in 1927, uh, Hawthorne Gray, an army Air Corps a balloonist was trying to set an altitude record. So he reached uh, actually uh, 40,000 feet uh, in uh, two different attempts to, to set an altitude record. He was using an oxygen breathing system, which was the, mo the best they had at the time, but it was still inadequate. On the second flight, uh, he ran out of oxygen and did not survive. Now, one of the reasons that scientists were interested in going to higher altitudes, not just, um, not just altitude records, but they discovered as you ascend, background radiation increased. And so uh, eventually it was determined that this radiation came from outside of our own atmosphere. So it was called cosmic radiation or cosmic rays. Now, uh, Swiss-born physicist Auguste Picard uh, wanted to go aloft in a balloon to study cosmic rays. So he was able to get support from the Belgian uh, National Fund for Scientific Research. And they funded a sealed capsule, a spherical gondola, that in 1931, he was able to reach 51,000 feet with it. Uh, this was the first flight into the stratosphere in a sealed capsule. And in many ways, his, uh, his capsule was the forerunner of uh, modern spacecraft. Now, in the United States, uh, the organizers of the Century of Progress Fair, uh, World's Fair in Chicago, they wanted to conduct a cosmic radiation flight from their location. They had hoped to recruit Auguste Picard uh, to, do, to do the flight. Uh, he had an identical twin brother, Jean Picard, who previously immigrated to the US. Now, Auguste wanted Jean to uh, make the flight. And Jean Picard, he uh, acted as intermediary. He also supervised the construction of the uh, capsule, the gondola. Now, the instruments were provided by Arthur Compton and Luis Alvarez, uh, both Nobel laureates. Uh, so they had some pretty uh, high power scientific uh, credentials behind them. Now Jean Picard managed to alienate the fair committee, so uh, he didn't get to fly. Uh, the first flight, which you see on the left, took off from Soldiers Field there adjacent to the uh, fairgrounds. Now, uh, Navy uh, Lieutenant Commander Tex Settle uh, was the balloonist. 
just after takeoff, the uh, vent valve in the top of the balloon malfunctioned and started venting off. They were using hydrogen for these balloons. So it started venting hydrogen. Uh, he didn't get any higher than 5,000 feet. And then the balloon settled back down to earth, uh, landed in the railroad yard adjacent to the, uh, to the launch site. They recovered the balloon, they recovered the, the capsule, refurbished it and got it ready to finally fly. But by that time, the World's Fair had closed, but the fair backers said, look, we, yeah, we want to redeem ourselves, let's make the flight. So this time Settle selected uh, Marine Corps Major uh, Chester uh, Forney to fly with him. And they took off from the uh, Goodyear Rubber Company plant in Akron, Ohio. Uh, Goodyear made the rubberized fabric that was used in the balloons. Uh, they took off, they reached uh, 61,000 feet, set an altitude record. Uh, they ended up landing in the, the marshes in Southern New Jersey. So they were getting kind of close to the Atlantic Ocean, but their flight uh, was uh, very successful. Well, then the National Geographic Society uh, teamed up with the Army Air Corps to sponsor two cosmic radiation flights, uh, Explorer, uh, Explorers One and Two. Explorer One carried a crew of three. Uh, they took off and were within a few hundred feet of uh, the altitude record set by the Century of Progress, but then the balloon tore and started descending. The, the crew was able to bail out, uh, barely. I mean, they, they had seconds to spare. Uh, but then, so the capsule was destroyed. Well, then the National Geographic Society had insured the capsule. So they took the insurance settlement and built a second capsule, Explorer II. Uh, Orville Anderson and Albert Stevens uh, were the pilots on that flight. Well, you see Captain Williams there in the group picture to the left. Uh, he was the, uh, flew the chase plane that they tracked the uh, balloon with. And they reached uh, over 70,000 feet uh, set an altitude record. Now there were a couple of other flight attempts, uh, mostly in Europe, primarily in Europe uh, after that, but that was kind of the high water mark for uh, stratospheric ballooning uh, prior to the Second World War. Of course, World War II halted all the balloon flights um, and the war ended with the development of the atomic bomb. Now at the time, the United States, we had a, a monopoly on the A-bomb, but we knew it was just going to be a matter of time until the Soviet Union developed their own. So to try to track uh, and monitor Soviet atomic tests, we started Project Mogul. Project Mogul used balloons to carry acoustical instruments into the upper atmosphere that would be able to monitor the pressure wave from an atomic bomb detonation. Now, Mogul uh, used polyethylene balloons. This was a new innovation. Uh, on the left there, you see the balloon as it first takes off. It looks like an inverted teardrop. Uh, all the gas is in a bubble in the top of the balloon envelope. And then as the balloon climbs, the gas expands and it inflates uh, the envelope to what you see on the right. Now, you'll notice the uh, payload is suspended from the balloon there. That's, that's a parachute. Uh, they came up, came up with a system of using an open parachute suspended by its apex from the balloon. So they could cut the balloon away and the parachute would open automatically. Uh, didn't have to have a deployment system on it. Um, now the Navy also started using polyethylene balloons. And by the way, these balloons were made out of polyethylene which is a lightweight, flexible, inexpensive material that's resistant to uh, ultraviolet radiation. It was ideal for these balloons. The Navy used the polyethylene balloon for Project Skyhook. Uh, that was a research project. Uh, they, they were flying scientific instruments, studying the upper atmosphere. Uh, now, some of the Skyhook balloons carried plates of photographic emulsion uh, that recorded the uh, passage of cosmic radiation particles uh, through it. So this became an important tool for studying uh, cosmic radiation. 
Now, at about the same time, in the late 40s, of course, the US Army was launching captured V-2 missiles at White Sands uh, Proving Ground. The Army turned over half a dozen missiles to the Air Force for something called Project Blossom, where the Air Force was allowed to put experiments in. One of the payloads that they tried, well, they tried it four times, uh, was uh, they put a monkey on these rockets. None of the monkeys survived. You didn't want to be a monkey at White Sands Proving Ground in the late 40s. Uh, so the parachutes failed. One of them, the rocket exploded. All, all the others, the parachutes failed. None of the monkeys survived. Uh, the last flight uh, carried a couple of mice. Uh, they got the film back from that. Um, now the project scientist for, for the Albert flights was uh, Dr. James Henry, who was from the uh, Aeromedical Laboratory at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. Um, he was assisted by uh, David Simons, uh, who was an Air Force flight surgeon. Now Simons uh, was actually born and grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, he attended Jefferson Medical School and then after graduation, uh, went into the Air Force and went into research. Uh, he was also fascinated with electronics. So he was assigned to the Aeromedical Laboratory at Wright Field and then accompanied uh, Dr. Henry on his, uh, on the flights down, the, the test flights down here at uh, Holloman, so, uh, or at, at White Sands. Now they were operating out of Holloman Air Force Base, which is just outside of Alamogordo, along the southern boundary of the uh, proving grounds. Uh, and at first, these were all done on an ad hoc basis, but eventually the pace picked up and they needed, a, the Air Force needed a more permanent uh, infrastructure. So they created the Aeromedical Field Laboratory and Simons was assigned there. Uh, a couple of months after he arrived, uh, Colonel John Paul Stapp came in. Uh, Stapp took, uh, took command of the uh, Aeromedical Field Laboratory. Now, Stapp is best known for his rocket sled work in the 40s and 50s. Uh, he'd made a, he made a total of 29 rocket sled rides, uh, the last three of which occurred at Holland. Uh, prior to that, he was using a rocket sled at Edwards Air Force Base. On his last sled run, uh, he reached uh, 632 miles an hour, sustained 43 Gs. At he was studying the effects of rapid deceleration and impact on the human body. Uh, he get, was on the cover of Time Magazine from that. Uh, and that was the last sled run he made was in December, 1954. Um, now Simons took over the cosmic radiation programs at the Aeromedical Field Laboratory. And he started launching small colonies of animals. They developed a, a biological capsule, was spherical. It had uh, oxygen supply, had chemical scrubbers in there to remove carbon dioxide as the animals exhaled. Uh, then it had a cooling system that was pretty ingenious. Now the boiling point of water decreases as you reduce pressure. So they had a container of water in the capsule that was vented to the outside. And as the, air, as the pressure was reduced, uh, the water would start to boil and the steam carried away excess cabin heat. Now these balloons were huge. Uh, they were going to 100,000 feet. So you see on the right side of the screen, there's one of these balloons with the gas bubble at the top that's going to expand as the balloon climbs and, and fill up. This is a 2 million cubic foot balloon. Now, uh, Simons launched dozens of these. Uh, and by 1954, uh, he, uh, Stapp called him in and said, well, Dave, I think you've gotten about as much data from the animal flights as you're going to. Are you ready to try a band flight now? And so Simon's thought about it. Now, the life support capabilities of the capsules were expressed in terms of the smallest animals they were flying, the mouse. So the life support capabilities was, they were expressed in what they called mouse units. 
Now, a hamster was about two mass units. A guinea pig was about three mass units. They were flying capsules with a life support capacity of 200 mass units. Uh, Simons calculated that the, uh, a human was about 500 mass units. So to scale up by a factor of two and a half, uh, he thought that was pretty straightforward and wasn't gonna present any severe problems. So he told staff, yeah, we could do that. So for their baseline study, they took one of the spherical capsules, split it in half and put a six foot cylinder in between the sections to build a capsule big enough for a pilot to sit in. Uh, they awarded a contract. Actually, the contract was only $29,000 uh, to Winsen Research uh, up in Minneapolis. Uh, the company was run by Otto Winsen and his wife, Vera. Now, Winsen had developed the or helped build the first polyethylene balloons for Skyhook. Uh, he was with General Mills at the time. He left there and started his own company, Winsen Research. Vera was in charge of the balloon production. So, and she actually held three patents in her own right for uh, balloon production techniques. Uh, now the target for Manhai was to reach 100,000 feet, remain there for 24 hours uh, with, a, with, with a pilot. So uh, Winsen came up with a system that was gonna use a 3 million cubic foot balloon. Uh, and it was going to, the capsule was going to be suspended from the balloon with a 40 foot cargo parachute. Now the normal landing technique was to vent gas from the balloon, and allow it to descend. But should something happen to the balloon or for some reason they couldn't descend, they could always cut it away and come back with that emergency parachute. Now fully inflated, the balloon was 200 feet in diameter. So these things were, were enormous. Uh, prior to launch, of course, with that little bubble of gas, the balloon was much longer. At launch, it was 350 feet tall, so the size of a 35-story building. And the plastic material was about the thickness of a hefty garbage bag, and the capsule was smaller than a telephone. So to go to 100,000 feet, that's almost 20 miles up. So you're going to be spent 24 hours, 20 miles above the earth, suspended from a balloon that's 200 feet in diameter, made a material the thickness of a hefty garbage bag sitting in a telephone booth. Uh, that was uh, pretty bold. Now here's the capsule, the schematic of the capsule as designed. Uh, it carried a five liter supply of liquid oxygen, which was enough for 48 hours. Uh, it had batteries before. It did have the uh, water uh, core cooling system uh, to maintain a comfortable temperature in there. Uh, they used uh, lithium hydroxide uh, to scrub carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, for emergency use, they had a 45-minute oxygen bottle inside there. And then finally, they had a, about a 20-minute bailout bottle. Now, Normally, they would vent gas. If need be, they could use that parachute. If for some reason, all that failed, uh, they could, act, the pilot could jettison the lower shell of the gondola and, or the capsule and bail out with a personal parachute. So they had three means of recovery in there. Uh, also, the seat was made out of nylon mesh. Uh, that was a major research project to come up with something that was comfortable to sit in for 24 hours. Uh, here's the instrument panel for man high, the first man high capsule. It was pretty basic. Uh, out, altitude, absolute air pressure, a door outside the capsule, uh, your um, cabin temperature, rate of climb. Uh, they did have a control panel uh, that they could turn systems on and off. Uh, so um, now for ballast, they had a uh, lead shot inside uh, the capsule that they, could, that they could jettison. Also the batteries themselves, they, they had an aluminum frame around the outside of the capsule that had the aircraft had lead acid 
aircraft batteries on it to power everything. As those batteries were depleted, uh, they could jettison those. Now they had parachutes on them, so you didn't have to worry about a car battery or an aircraft battery plummeting from the sky. Uh, so uh, the atmosphere, they chose a gas mixture of 60% oxygen, 20% nitrogen, and 20% helium. Uh, they chose to pressurize the capsule at a pressure equivalent of 26,000 feet, which is 270 millimeters of mercury. Uh, in contrast, here at sea level, what we breathe is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other gases. The pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury, which translates to 14.7 pounds per square inch. At 26,000 feet, it's um, only 5.2 pounds per square inch. Now, however, the, the oxygen content of that 760 at sea level, it's 160 millimeters of oxygen. So by having a 60% atmosphere in that cap, that capsule, even at the reduced pressure, it still contained 162 millimeters of oxygen. So they were getting the same oxygen that they were getting that you get here on the ground. The reason they went with the oxygen, nitrogen, helium mixture was because they were concerned about flammability. They wanted to reduce the chances of a fire inside the, uh, the capsule. Uh, Dave Simons uh, was the chief scientist for Manheim. Uh, he fully expected to be the first pilot. Uh, and so he was looking forward to that flight. He was involved with the design, testing, and construction of the capsule. Staff overruled him, though, and said, look, we need to make a test flight. Uh, you need a test pilot to fly this thing first before we put you in there. And so they selected Captain uh, Joseph W. Kittinger. Uh, Kittinger was a uh, pilot assigned to the Fighter Test Division at the uh, Holloman Air Force Base. And he had become sort of the unofficial test pilot for the Aeromedical Field Laboratory. Stapp had a lot of respect for his flying abilities, uh, deservedly so. And so, uh, Kittinger was uh, selected to make the first Mannheim flight. Um, here we see uh, Kittinger in the capsule. Now they would board the capsule. Everything was suspended from that section that has the portholes in it called the turret. Uh, the seat, the life support system, everything was attached to that. And then they would lift it up, hoist it up and lower it into the lower body shell, clamp everything together and be ready to go. Now, um, Kittinger is holding the uh, emergency parachute in his lap. Once the capsule was closed up, uh, he would hang that on the, on the wall of the capsule. So on June 2nd, 1957, uh, he was ready to he made his flight. Now they, since it was a test flight, they used a 2 million cubic foot balloon. So he wasn't gonna reach the full 100,000 foot altitude. Um, and it was gonna be a 12 hour flight. Everything proceeded smoothly, but then shortly after he took off, Kittinger noticed that the cabin pressure wasn't behaving the way he expected it would, but since nobody had ever flown the capsule before, he decided to proceed with the flight. Uh, at one point though, he was asked to uh, uh, check all the different channels on the radio set. And when he did, the knob uh, came loose. So he couldn't transmit to the ground anymore through voice communications. He had to go to the backup um, Morse code transmitter. So he's tapping out Morse code signals uh, to the ground. Um, shortly after, a couple hours after launch, he reached his peak altitude of about 96,000 feet. Uh, he also reported to the ground that his five liter oxygen supply was down to two liters only 40% remained. So they were trying to figure out what happened, um, trying to diagnose what was going on. Uh, Simons was in a, a, a helicopter uh, following the flight path. Uh, Winson and uh, Stapp were, were in a second helicopter. And so uh, 
Simons could hear the Morse code and knew something was, was amiss, but he couldn't reach, they were out of range of the uh, winds and plant. Now the flight took off, since it, since it was a test flight, the flight took off from uh, the winds and research uh, plant at uh, the field operations at uh, Fleming Field in South St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So uh, what Simons had to do then was to have them land at a gas station. He ran out and found a payphone and called back to the Winsen plant and got the uh, lowdown of what was happening. So then they everybody decided, let's meet back at Winsen. So they all, everybody hopped in their helicopters and, and they flew back uh, there. And by that time, uh, he only, Kittinger only had 10% of his oxygen supply remaining. They figured that was just enough for about three hours, which would get him back to the ground. So he was told to begin his descent. His initial response was, come and get me. Uh, they were afraid that he had suffered from something called uh, the breakaway phenomenon, which was a sense of detachment that high altitude pilots had reported previously. Turns out he was just joking. And so after staff told him, if you don't start your descent right away, we're going to cut you loose and bring you back to the parachute. Uh, Simon, or staff, or Kittinger said, okay, fine. And he started his descent. So he made his uh, descent. He was coming out. The oxygen, again, he had barely enough. The oxygen tank was reading zero. Uh, so finally, he landed near Weaver, uh, Minnesota, in the Indian Creek. Uh, Oxygen tank was completely empty. He was fine, though, uh, climbed out of the capsule, climbed up the uh, banks of the creek. They got him out of his flight suit because those things were, he wore a partial pressure suit and those were pretty hot, pretty uncomfortable. Uh, so then he talked to uh, Simons and they, they took the capsule back to Winsen and they found out what, what had happened was, well, the communications problem, if he'd had a screwdriver or even a pen knife, he could have fixed that because it was a loose screw. Uh, the community or the oxygen problem was somebody had misrouted the pressure controller for the capsule. So the oxygen, instead of going into the capsule, was being dumped overboard. Well, they were able to fix all that. And Simons was looking forward to uh, making the full scientific flight. Then they hit a brick wall. Uh, the debt ceiling reached its legal limit. And so military research projects were slashed. Uh, they were faced with, they had no, no choice but to mothball uh, Mannheim. Now, every, they all knew that the startup costs would be prohibitively high. So the, uh, you know, this was pretty much the end of Mannheim. Uh, so, so Simons went up to Winsen and was packing up all the, all the supplies, uh, getting ready to ship everything back to the Air Medical Field Laboratory, when Otto and Vera Winsen called him into their office, and they said, Dave, it's going to cost $14,000 to make your flight. Uh, now, we figure that it'll give a lot of good publicity to the company and a lot of goodwill from the Air Force. So we're going to pay for the flight. So Winsen actually supported uh, the full 24-hour flight. So everything kicked in the high gear. Uh, Simons was ready to, 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 make, to make, his, uh, make his flight. And uh, so on the evening of um, August uh, the 18th, uh, 1957, uh, he boarded the capsule, they sealed it, they pressurized it properly, made a leak, did a leak check, got the gases, the cabin atmosphere gases adjusted. Then they loaded him on the back of a truck and took him out to the launch site. Now, the winds and plant was in uh, South St. Paul near Minneapolis. Um, the launch site was a 450 foot deep open pit iron mine in Crosby, uh, the Portsmouth mine. Uh, the reason they went into the, to 
these open pit mines like that was because they would be shielded from the surface winds while they inflated the balloon. So uh, during the trip up to, uh, to Crosby, they had to stop at an all night gas station, and fuel up the truck and Simons is sitting in the capsule in the back of the truck. Uh, well, then they, uh, they arrived at the Portsmouth mine about five o'clock in the morning and they start, finally started to inflate the balloon. Now, one of the characteristics of these balloons too is once you unfold it, once you unpack it, you either fly it or you throw it away. They're pretty, fra they're pretty fragile. Uh, so shortly after they started to inflate it, uh, they realized they had a problem. Uh, one of the packing bands uh, had not been removed. And so about 30 feet off the ground, uh, you had this constriction on the balloon. They couldn't launch the balloon like that because it couldn't inflate. So they found a ladder from the uh, mine office. Uh, they raised it up, uh, secured it with some guy wires, uh, guys on the ground held it. And then Vera Winson climbed up that ladder and reached out with a pair of scissors to cut the packing band. Since she was in charge of the balloon production, she knew it best. She was probably the, the, she was the most qualified person to do this because if they nicked the balloon, it would be ruined. Well, she was able to, to get rid of the packing band. Uh, the balloon inflation continued. Uh, then the winds started to pick up a little bit, uh, the, the surface winds. So they manhandled the capsule a little bit deeper down into the, uh, into the, um, mine and then finally released it uh, started climbing um, everything was going perfectly uh, Simons reported that all was well uh, they kept, they were tracking it from the ground with a telescope watched the balloon inflate it passed through the jet stream with no no issues everything was fine and then finally about uh, two and a half hours after launch, Simons reached 102,400 feet uh, above sea level. Uh, there he spent the day doing uh, different research and different, different experiments. Um, now there was a thunderstorm, a line of thunderstorms off in the distance and they were heading in their direction now or heading towards, the, towards Crosby. Now everybody figured that the Storms would pass underneath the balloon uh, during the night, and then in the morning everything would be fine, and Simons could could make his landing. Uh, well, there was a problem. Now Simon settled in for the night. What happened was the storm stalled. It got under him, and then it stopped. So Simons went to sleep, uh, and then suddenly the capsule lurched. Uh, woke him up. He looked at the portholes couldn't see any stars, realized that he was down in the storm. The balloon had cooled enough to descend to about 68,000 feet. So he had to drop some ballast uh, to rise up above the storm because the, the lightning was uncomfortably close, he said. So he, uh, so he managed to uh, go back up to a, a near 100,000 feet, uh, then he sat there and watched the sunrise. Uh, first time anyone had ever seen a sunrise from the edge of space. So uh, then the storm was still there though. It didn't, it didn't budge. So he couldn't land. So now because the capsule had cooled, the flight was going on longer than 24 hours. Uh, the lithium hydroxide was not working as efficiently as it should uh, to, rem to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So CO2 starts building up in the, in the, uh, in the cabin. Uh, so Simons had to go on his faceplate of, uh, of his pressure suit, put the faceplate in place and just breathe oxygen through his suit and give the lithium hydroxide time to, uh, to, to work. Uh, finally, the CO2 level got down to a low enough level and he was able to take the faceplate off. Uh, but then the capsule, again, still up there, it's starting to, uh, electricity starting to become an issue. So he has to turn off the cooling system. Uh, 
So now he's, get, he's tired, he's hot. Finally, the storm cleared. He's able to start uh, his descent. But then as the balloon descended, it would heat up, the gas would expand and it would climb back up again. So did this yo-yo motion for several hours until finally he was able to establish a uh, rate of descent. Uh, but then with these balloons, as you go through the tropopause, go from the stratosphere to the troposphere, whatever descent rate you had established is gonna double. So now he's descending at a thousand feet per minute. He'd already dropped all the ballast that he could, so he just braced for a hard landing, which it was, but he landed in, the, uh, in an alfalfa field in southeastern uh, South Dakota. And um, the, uh, you know, the farmer was out there on his tractor, had his son with him. Uh, his son was more excited about the helicopter than he was by the capsule. But Mannheim was, it was a success. Uh, all the data from it though, they didn't, they didn't have the money to analyze the data. So it was put into storage. Well, then Simons appeared on the cover of Life magazine and he went to the world, he was going to the World Space Congress in, uh, in uh, Barcelona that year, where he was going to deliver a, uh, a paper on his, uh, on his flight to the edge of space. When he landed, he learned that the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik 1, the world's first satellite. Um, now, the U.S. response to Sputnik included the creation of NASA, the passage of the National Defense Education Act, and the Air Force decided to proceed with the third Manhai flight. Now, Manhai 3 had a whole new capsule. Uh, you notice the outside is painted white. Uh, that was to reflect uh, the heat. Plus, it was a bigger capsule. It was the same diameter, but it was nine feet long. So that gave them more room inside to, uh, to put more instrumentation uh, and uh, do more research with it. Now, the uh, capsule, they, they, they changed a few things with it. Uh, most importantly, they removed the water core cooling system because they thought that the change in insulation would keep the capsule cool. So they didn't need to actively cool it. They also uh, took the lithium hydroxide scrubbers out and replaced them with potassium hydroxide, which is more energetic, more efficient, plus potassium hydroxide will absorb moisture. So it would serve as a dehumidifier as well. Um, the pilot was gonna be Captain Grover Shock, but then he was on a training flight uh, with auto winds in, in their sky car system. There was an accident and both Shock and uh, Winsen were critically injured. So now they, they were out of their pilot. So they had to select a new one. Well, General Don Flickinger, who was head of human factors for the Air Research and Development Command suggested that they develop testing protocols, selection tests that would be used for future space pilots. So they did. That included uh, medical evaluation at the Lubbock's Clinic in Albuquerque, psychological testing, centrifuge runs, basically the same battery of tests that later were used for Project Mercury. Uh, so they finally selected uh, Lieutenant Clifton McClure, who was a pilot at Holloman. Uh, to, make the, to make the flight. Now, he had a master's degree in ceramics engineering. Um, now, one of the environmental issues with these high altitude balloon flights is there's only a, a certain period of time during the year when they can fly them. Uh, the winds tend to shift uh, in the upper atmosphere. So uh, by the time they got ready to fly, uh, they were it looked like he was gonna land. If he took off from Crosby, it was a very real risk. He was gonna land in the middle of Hudson Bay. Uh, now, one of, the, one of the problems that they had, they couldn't just delay the flight or postpone it either because by that time, uh, the White House had announced that NASA was gonna have the, the mission of launching humans into space. So the Air Force really had no rationale for launching uh, Man High 3. Uh, they lost the man in space mission. Uh, now the equipment was already bought and paid for. So the Air Force told uh, 
the Aeromedical Field Laboratory. Yeah, make the flight, but get it over with. No delays, no overruns. Just get it and be done with it because you've already got everything ready. So McClure had to get his balloonist license. The weather was pretty bad. By the time he did, it was the 1st of October. Well, the weather had already shifted, so they had to move the flight. They moved it instead to Holloman Air Force Base. Now they would have had to. Now they had to take off from the runway at Holloman, so they didn't have the protection of the uh, pit mine. Um, they decided to take off at dawn, uh, which is when the winds were at their minimum before they before they had a chance to pick up for the day. So first night. Also, when they moved everything to Holloman, they decided to use an all Air Force crew to launch everything instead of using the Winsen crew because it was more economical. The Air Force crew wasn't quite as well practiced as the Winsen crew was, so they took a little bit longer. Uh, they got everything ready, but then by the time they started to inflate the balloon, the uh, winds had started to pick up and the balloon ended up being dashed into the ground and it popped. They only had two balloons that were man rated. So now uh, they're down to one balloon. They decided to try again the next day. <clears throat> because every, everything had been moved around and jostled around, had that flight attempt, the packing pins in the emergency parachute had worked loose. So McClure boarded the capsule with no incident. They started doing the, uh, you know, again, checking out the atmosphere, purging nitrogen out of it, adding helium, getting everything uh, adjusted. McClure was asked to uh, give a reading from one of the instruments in the cabin. As he turned, he bumped the parachute with his elbow. The parachute came open. So he's sitting there with a lap full of fabric. Now, he's not sure should he report this or not. He knew if he did, at the very least, they'd have to open the capsule, repack the parachute, put him in there and go through the process again, which would delay everything for several hours. Uh, by that time, the winds would have picked up. He didn't, the problem was he didn't know if they'd unpack the balloon or not. So what he chose to do was to remain quiet about it. And he repacked the parachute in this capsule in his lap. First time he did, he got it packed. Then he realized he put closing pins in backwards. So he popped it open again, repacked it, and this time got the pins in properly. But in doing so, he was sweating profusely. Uh, well, then um, he saturated the air in the capsule. Now, potassium, hydro or, um, uh, yeah, potassium hydroxide, when it gets wet, it gives off heat. So now you've got the life support system, uh, the CO2 scrubber blowing out hot air. Well, he took off on October 8th, 1958, uh, the 3 million cubic foot balloon headed for 100,000 feet. Um, shortly after he got to altitude, he reported he was very thirsty. Uh, he was a little warm. Uh, he was also very sluggish. They asked him to report his temperature. It was uh, almost 100 degrees. Then he reported his temperature again. It was over 100. So finally, they made the decision when, when he hit 104, they said, look, we got to get him down. So they, because there's no way to cool the capsule. So they started the descent. Uh, again, he went through this yo yo effect of the balloon going up and down until finally he could establish a, uh, a uh, steady rate of descent. He ended up actually. Uh, after, just after sundown, landing uh, up on White Sands uh, Missile Range. And uh, it was actually the best landing in the program. Uh, his body temperature had hit 108.1 degrees. So, you know, but uh, so it ended up being not really a test of spacecraft design, but a test of uh, human will and motivation. So that ended Project Manhunt. Now, at the time, there were other balloon projects underway. Uh, the U.S. Navy was flying the Stratolab program. That was a uh, sealed capsule, carried two pilots at a time. Uh, down the bottom left there, that's the, uh, the uh, Stratolab team uh, pilots there 
well, they made four flights with the spherical capsule. Now the capsule was originally designed for an earlier project by Jean Picard, uh, but then that got shelved. And then later the capsule was, uh, it was stored over here at Lakehurst and it was resurrected, outfitted, and equipped for uh, Stratolab, uh, the Stratolab program. They also did a series of open gondola flights using oxygen uh, masks, able to reach 45,000 feet uh, with those under Stratolab. Now there were the fifth Stratolab flight, uh, Stratolab High 5 was the most extreme test of uh, pressure suits up to that time. Uh, it was on May 4th, 1961, the day before Alan Shepard made the first US space flight. Uh, they wore mercury pressure suits, the Navy Mark IV with a uh, luminized cover layer. They reached 113,000 feet uh, in an open gondola. Uh, they took off from the deck of the USS Antietam uh, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Antietam could match the wind, so they got an effective wind speed of zero for launch. Well, then the uh, once they landed, they actually splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico. They had flotation blocks on the capsule. Uh, they didn't have the horse collar that they did for recovery of the astronauts. So instead, they, they lowered the, uh, the cable with a hook on the end. You had to step on the hook, grab the cable, and get hoisted up into the, uh, the helicopter. Uh, Malcolm Ross, uh, the commander, he, he got up fine. Victor Prather, uh, who was a uh, Navy flight surgeon, uh, he slipped off the hook, uh, landed and fell in the water. His suit filled with water and he drowned. Uh, so that brought a tragic end to what was you know, otherwise a, a brilliant uh, balloon flight. Joe Kittinger went on to Project Excelsior which was a high altitude uh, parachute test. Uh, the Air Force was trying to develop a system for high altitude uh, escape. So uh, Kittinger did three high altitude jumps, the highest one from 102,800 feet. Uh, he also participated in Project Stargazer, which was a program where the Air Force was going to launch a sealed capsule uh, with uh, a balloonist and a scientist, an astronomer, to do astronomical observations from the upper atmosphere. They made one flight, then the Air Force pulled funding, and that was the end of high altitude uh, ballooning by the, uh, by, the, by the military. So what was achieved? Well, during man high, of course, they developed the medical evaluation for astronauts. Uh, that was, you know, again, what they used in Mercury, paralleled, um, copied, um, what they used for man high three. They developed biotelemetry techniques, uh, being able to monitor the health and wellness of a pilot in a remote environment. They operated in a space equivalent environment. From a physiological perspective, 100,000 feet, you might as well be 100 miles. Uh, the physiological effects are gonna be very similar. So they were in a space equivalent, plus the experience designing a sealed capsule that led to uh, later uh, spacecraft developments. Again, as Eleanor mentioned during her introduction, uh, I've got a book out there, Touching Space. It's available from either Schiffer Publishing, who published it, or you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, and then, so are there any questions? Wow, that was awesome, Greg. And I have to say, I never fully appreciated how incredibly crazy this program was. I well, don't yeah. know if other people agree, but I sat here with my jaw on the floor listening to this. Yeah, they flew three pilots and they darn near killed all three of them. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I do have a couple questions, maybe just sure. to lead off. Um, you know, at the beginning when you mentioned Auguste Picard, isn't that family also... I mean, a later, uh, I guess a later member of the family was part of the crew that was part of that first round the world flight in a balloon. Oh yeah, well, Auguste's uh, son, uh, now Auguste Picard, he left ballooning and then, then looked undersea. He developed uh, the Batiscape. Okay. Batiscape Trieste, 
uh, had his son uh, Jacques in it. Uh, and they, when they reached the Marianas Trench, the deepest part in the ocean. And then uh, Jacques' son, uh, Bertrand Picard, he and Brian Jones did the first nonstop around the world balloon flight. That's right. I couldn't remember the other guy's name. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was another pretty amazing, amazing. Oh, it flight. was. It, it, it truly was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then and then uh, also uh, Jean Picard, uh, he did finally get to fly the Century of Progress gondola. Uh, he and his wife Jeanette uh, flew. Uh, she became the first woman to reach the, uh, the stratosphere. Hmm. Wow. And, and, and then their son, Don Picard, developed the modern high or the modern hot air balloon. Wow. And then in the 24th century, Jean-Luc Picard. No, just <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but they spell the name differently. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, the other question I have um, is that um, I ha I'm glad that I understand now. I always wondered why it seemed so random that these flights were conducted outside of Minneapolis. But now I understand the origin of the, the guy that was developing these polyethylene balloons. But um, is there any memorial to Man High up there? Anything uh, that like, would be worth a road trip to see? There, there is a historical marker in Crosby. And then last week I saw on Facebook, somebody posted a picture of a mural at Crosby. And then the, the local museum uh, there had a replica of the capsule built that you, that you could climb into. Uh, the other reason for doing the flights in the northern latitudes like that is that the Earth's magnetic field deflects cosmic radiation. And so it's only in the northern latitudes that the cosmic, cosmic rays get low enough that you can explore them with balloons. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. The other thing that amazed me was, of course, I always think of Joe Kittinger, you know, bailing out at 103,000 feet in a parachute. Um, but I did not realize that the Navy actually has the, I guess, the balloon altitude record of 113,000 feet. I did not know that. Well, since then, uh, of course, Felix Baumgartner went mm -hmm. to uh, 100 and, uh, what, 128,000 feet uh, for the uh, 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 Red Bull uh, Stratos project where he bailed out. And then um, the, uh, the guy from the, uh, from, uh, from Google uh, went to 136,000 feet uh, mm. and, and parachuted down. So um, yeah, so there've been two flights since then, but that's still pretty far up there. Okay. Yeah. Actually, Alan Eustace is who you're thinking Alan of. Alan Eustace, yes, thank you. I, I just, I went blank on his yeah. name. But yeah, and then also um, uh, there was a, uh, uh, Nicholas Piantanita over in New Jersey was trying to do a private effort to uh, do a balloon jump, and he ended up actually dying in, in the process. Mm. But he, but he, he was up there too. I mean, I think he he beat the uh, the record by um, Strato Lab High Five in in the late sixties. Mm. Actually, we have a question from Carrie, who's on the line. Did any other countries have high altitude balloon programs at the same time? Uh, well, yes, during the 30s, uh, it was almost like a, a precursor to the space race where the Soviet Union launched several balloons and uh, we were launching balloons. There was, there was a project in Poland uh, in 1936, but the balloon caught fire. And so that, that never went anywhere. And there was a, pro a proposal in Spain for a high altitude uh, balloon project, but the Spanish uh, Civil War preempted that. Hmm. Okay. I did want to mention for the group um, that if you have interest, um, other than, of course, reading Greg's book, um, which I'm sure he'd love, love it if you'd buy his book, um, there was an American Experience show uh, back in 2019 on um, basically this pre-space pre age, uh, these programs um, called... Um, I want to say it was called Space Men. Yes, um, Space, Space Men. Yes, yeah. I was. I was on that. Were you? Were you on that? That was a good. That was great. I. That was another. Like I sat yeah. there with my jaw on the floor watching this. So, um, I think there are a couple clips and things I could post on YouTube if people are interested, so you could see that. Or I think you can view it online now. 
um, yeah. on the local PBS, your local PBS station site. Um, so um, I'm going to open it up for some other uh, other comments. Oh, uh, Tom Kubica on the line said Greg's book is terrific. So there's there's a oh, round thank of you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Yep. And Mark Winslow actually just said, yeah, the American Experience Program was outstanding. Um, Dan um, Myers has a question for you about uh, weather balloons. Sure. Well, first of all, I wanted to comment. I'm surprised that uh, when the balloons went up in Minnesota and also at the Gulf of Mexico, that they seemed to land pretty close to where they were launched. Usually you think of a balloon going up and it, it drifts and goes for miles and miles and miles. And my question on weather balloons, if you can answer it, I understand that certain uh, federal government agencies like the FAA, National Weather Service, the military, et cetera, they launch weather balloons. And I was always mystified why, how could they launch balloons? And I think some of them are tethered without airplanes running into them. Well, they have a transponder in them. Uh, plus they, they have, they public, they post a note and they have to get clearance and everything's regulated. Because uh, because right now there's a lot of student groups that are building balloons uh, to uh, and they're launching them to 100,000 feet uh, with cameras and all kinds of uh, interesting things. And again, you have to get prior clearance from the FAA. You've got to have uh, radar reflectors and all kinds of uh, equipment on them. Are are they tethered or are the weather? Balloons? Oh no 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 they're they're free balloons. Okay, and and could you just uh, could you comment on why why it, 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 when the balloons went up in Minnesota and you said the Gulf of Mexico, that they landed relatively close to where they're launched. Usually, you know, we see balloons, uh, guys going for a ride in a balloon, the thing just goes for miles and miles and miles. And I'm surprised that it landed so close to where it was launched. Well, they were landing uh, like a couple hundred miles away or some of them. Well, again, remember the, uh, the Century of Progress took off in Ohio and landed in New Jersey. Uh, but the, uh, the plastic ones, yeah, they, they had, uh, they would, had a tear panel in them that would release all the gas. So then it was just the plastic just fluttering down like a streamer. So okay. they, came, they, they came for, in fact, actually I, I've heard stories that a lot of the uh, housewives on farms uh, up in that part of the country used to love these balloons because it meant they had plastic wrap, food wrap for the whole winter. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Enjoyed the presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you know, I have a question. You mentioned about that when Manhide 2 was completed, they ran out of money at the time, so they did they weren't able to analyze the data. But then they went on to do Manhide 3, of course. Did they finally have the ability to analyze the data for Manhide 2 to plan Manhide 3? Oh, yeah. Yeah. After, uh, after Sputnik, uh, the Air Force came up with the funds to analyze the data and then also fund a third flight. Okay. Where are those records maintained? I honestly don't know. I've never, I never found the original flight records. Um, I presume they would be at Maxwell Air Force Base in the Air Force Historical Center. Mm. Uh, I know I went all through the, what they, they had at Holloman and uh, it wasn't much. I, I copied what they had. Uh, Winsen, uh, actually now it's uh, Aerostar. Uh, they, had all the technical reports. So all, all the records that they generated, uh, they had the uh, chief engineer there uh, was a history buff and he saw to it that everything was preserved. Okay. Yeah. Great. Anybody else with any questions? We've gotten a couple of kudos here on the, on the chat for great presentation. Oh, well, thank I, you. I would definitely concur. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right. Okay. Well, I guess not. Well, Greg, okay. this, this was absolutely a pleasure. Um, I'd, I'd love to have you back for another talk because uh, I know you have several other books that you've written. So maybe we could have, we can talk about you coming back in 2022. Okay. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll be able to do a live program in Warminster, which would be fabulous. Great. Um, so um, I want to thank you again. And um, again, for the audience, please join us in October uh, for Michelle Evans, who will be returning to give uh, a talk about Mike Adams and the X-15. So uh, for those of you that actually heard Michelle 
um, live actually <laughs> in one of our last programs before uh, the pandemic. Um, she did a great, great presentation on the overall X15 program. So I'm sure that this will, will equally be uh, fantastic. So I um, just want to thank you again, Greg, and uh, appreciate pleasure. it. And I hope you have a good evening and good evening to everyone else and see you next month. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone.